All right. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, uh, June 6th, I believe. Uh, maybe not where you are if you're in another country. Uh, coming to you live from the Functional Aging Summit, though you may be watching this on a recording later. That's uh, fantastic if you are. We have got Guy Andrews back again from Exercise Etc. This is session number two. So if you're looking for recordings and you're looking for the plastic cup session, this is not that recording. Um, that was done live yesterday and you'll have both of those available. If you're on here live and you missed yesterday's, uh, it was a fantastic session as well. Uh, today, Guy's gonna be doing Forever Functional, a dozen group balance drills for seniors. If you've not seen Guy speak before ever, if this is your first time ever seeing Guy speak, I would love for you to type that in the chat box. Yesterday, I was shocked, actually, Guy, how many people, it was their first time ever seeing you speak, so that's great. It was good. Introducing you to more new people, and of course, you had a lot of uh, regular faithful followers. So I'm going to turn it over to Guy. Please keep your camera off. I see many of you coming in. Please keep your camera off. I'm going to turn my camera off, Guy, and I'm going to let you take it away, and if there's time at the end and we can do live Q&A, we'll let everybody jump on Brady Bunch style, and uh, we'll do cameras, so... Take it away, thanks, sir. Thank you, sir, and thanks for the invite. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Functional Aging Institute. Uh, my name is Guy Andrews. For those of you guys who I have not met, either in person or online, I am based down here in beautiful Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I no longer say sunny because we have not seen sunshine in several weeks. We are getting one or two inches of rain every day. Yesterday, a thunderstorm briefly knocked me off of my webinar. Um, we got back on. I'm working today from my home and I've got a backup generator. So there's no thunder quite yet. So we'll see how this goes. I guess I will just have to talk faster. For those of you guys who I have not met, there's me. Um, I've been in the fitness industry for going on 40 years, uh, which is amazing to me. It, so it sounds so long. I got a couple of calls, not calls, emails yesterday. There was a curiosity. I'm going to be 62 in a couple of weeks. So that's the background, certainly nothing to hide. I am very, very rapidly gaining on the older adult demographic myself. I only work with seniors. I work in the Parks and Recreation Department for the city of Wilton Manors, Florida, which is a suburb of Fort Lauderdale. And I'm gonna leave the bio with that. It's on here in the handout if you want it. The handout is available as a PDF. I'll give you that information later on. And I'm gonna get rid of my screen like that. And because I am working from home, I have an audience. They are sound asleep on the sofa behind my desk. So there is my audience. So without any further ado, we're going to go right into functional activities for older adults. These first couple of slides are introductory and I'm going to go through them a little bit quickly because I really want to save time for the actual activities. But as you know, before you begin any kind of a fall prevention program, Assess the client for fall risk. If your client has been quarantined or on lockdown for a while, mine have been on lockdown for almost three months now here in Florida, we've got to assume that when they come back, they will have lost strength, they will have lost function. They might be more of a fall risk than they were when last you saw them. So keep that in mind. And for all the drills you do, we do, make sure there's support nearby a table, a chair, a countertop, a wall, something that they can hang on to if they do in fact lose the balance. You wanna make sure they're wearing good, well-supported footwear, no flip-flops, no, no, no flip-flops ever because of the fall risk. And I begin every one of my programs with the mantra, do what you can, when you can, if you can. I leave it up to them to determine their capacity and when they're getting tired. What you don't want is a tired older adult in a balance program, because the more fatigued they are, the more risk they have of falling. And what I always do, because I work with a large group, I work with 40 or 50 people at a time, I request, kind of like being in middle school, that when they leave the room, they notify somebody, just for fear that if they leave and they're dizzy or lightheaded, they might pass out somewhere and we're not aware of it. So this is some background information. We need to keep in mind that all seniors are different. You know, we have got folks who are in their 70s and 80s who are very athletic. We've got folks in their 50s and 60s who are debilitated and probably bordering on frail. So 
make sure you're able to modify every activity for your individual or for your group. And keep in mind that if something is, does not work, abandon it. You know, just move on to something else. All the drills and some of the games we're going to see today, see today they have no rules. It's not like there is a, you know, international arbit arbitration board that determines the rules. Make it up and modify as you go along, okay? And that's pretty much how that's going to work. And to me, most important rule is my balance classes are like a big party. They are actually like a social event for my folks. We laugh a lot. We laugh loud and often. And I think that's arguably as important as the fitness goals that we're trying to achieve and the drills that are going to help us to accomplish those goals. Um, you know, again, more disclaimers. If your client is a fall risk, if they are frail, if they're in pain management, meaning they're on opioids, if they've got chronic debilitating diseases, these drills we're going to see today are probably not appropriate for them. At Exercise Etc., we do have a program on balance for the frail elder, but this is not that program. So we're dealing with the seniors that many of us are seeing. They're active, they're functional, they're vibrant, they're living independently, and they want to stay that way. These first couple of slides, guys, are in your handout. I'm not going to take the time to go over them. They are the reviews of the research that form the back, backbone for all of our programs, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a review from the National Institute of Health, back from 18. And what these all point to is the exact same thing, that balanced programs work. They keep older adults upright. They keep them independent. They reduce the risk of falling and injury. And very importantly, as documented in this review on the bottom of your page from the ACSM, not only do they make people stronger physically, they boost confidence as well. And that is a huge, huge benefit. The research is showing us that balanced training in a physical therapy environment after knee or hip replacement res delivers much, much better results and better outcomes. So your client who is going for hip or knee replacement, balanced training both before and after that is a vital tool. For those of you guys who were with me yesterday, we talked about this, the importance of assessing balance via the one-legged stand. I assume if you're working with seniors, you're familiar with this drill, but the upshot is if your older client cannot stand on each leg independently and without support for five seconds, they've got to be considered a fall risk. So I do the one-legged stand with all of my new clients. And I generally start off each program with this as well, because you know, they've got good days and bad days. Somebody who was very stable last week might be for a variety of reasons, a little less stable this week. I do this just so I'm aware of what I'm dealing with and what precautions and modifications I need to make. So that's the background. Let's get to the good stuff, get to the curriculum. The bottom line is that Balance training is strength training. That's the bottom line. And even if you don't call your senior programs balance training, if you're doing strength training, it is going to help to keep them balanced. When we lose our balance, the muscular system kicks in from the toes all the way up to the shoulders. You know, what happens is we lose our balance, our toes grip the floor. The muscles of the calf begin to contract to decelerate the ankle the core muscles kick in to stabilize and decelerate the spine. The muscle of the hips and the thighs kick in. So what we've got is a whole body activity where literally, again, from the toes to the shoulders, all of our muscles contract simultaneously to decelerate that downward pull of gravity and to keep us upright. If you don't call your senior program as balance training, if you call it strength training, here, though, are some of the goals of a strength training slash fall prevention training program. From the core to the toes and the calves, the hips and the thighs. And that's why in a balance program, you know, we are doing all kinds of controlled core work. We're not ignoring the toes and the heels and the ankles, but we're also doing deadlifts and lunges 
and squats to keep that lower body strong and functional. And we're gonna see momentarily how all of this is going to work. So balance training 101, if you are dealing with somebody who has lost function during the lockdown or they're frail, maybe they have fallen, maybe they have had a hip or a knee replacement. It always begins with core training. Core training has got to come first and you may well be working with them initially in their chair as they begin. You know, chairs is where it begins until we can get to the client to the point where we can progress them to standing and then moving. And in our workshop today, we're gonna to start seated, go to standing and finish with moving drills. So core training first, then ankle and toe mobility. And here are just a couple of suggestions to work the core for the more frail odor or somebody who has a fall risk. It could be as easy as just having them squeeze a ball or a balloon. It could be as easy as having them have a piece of elastic tubing and just pull it apart. If they're standing up straight and breathing properly, meaning not holding their breath, just the act of squeezing a ball or pulling on a piece of elastic tubing is going to go a great way to increasing the function and the strength of the core in general and the inner unit muscles of the core in particular. We try and hold these for anywhere from five to 10 seconds at a time and your client will absolutely be able to feel those core muscles tighten up as they are pulling or pushing. This is what we're looking for and this is just the very beginning level of our core training. From there, for your more able client, this is one of my very favorite exercises, pair them up. You can maintain social distance, put them in a small group, and just have them take a stability ball and roll it or bounce it or toss it to each other. You know, that ball has got some real mass to it and they've got to be able to control their core and their vertical alignment when they are either stooping to stop the ball from rolling or standing up to catch a bounce ball or to, cancel, to catch a ball that has been tossed to them. So the stability ball bounce or toss is a great way to put their core to work while the client is upright and while they are working functionally. As always, if they are a fall risk, I would have either a table or a wall behind them so that if they start to back up too quickly and they cannot decelerate, they've got that wall or that table to stop them. So it's the very, very basic core training drills to begin. When we lose our balance, the first thing that's going to happen is our toes begin to grip the floor and our calf muscles, our gastrocnemius and soleus, begin to contract. The muscle of the toe and the muscle of the calf need to be strong. These next drills can be done individually or with a group and it's designed to strengthen these important muscles of the lower leg. It can be as simple as a seated ankle mobility drill. All they're doing is they are sitting down, they're tapping their toes, and they're lifting their heels. That's all there is to it. I like to have them do eight or 10 of each before they move on. Do three, four sets. With this drill, you know, it's not weight bearing, so we are working on mobility. Now we've got an alternating heel lift and toe lift, duplicating the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion that goes on as we walk. I encourage my folks to do this several times per day. You know, many of them sit a lot, probably sit too much. It's something they can safely do in their chair to work on strengthening and increasing the range of motion of the ankle. We can't neglect our toes. A toe scrunch is a very, very simple exercise. Again, they can do it anywhere. They can do it in or out of their shoes. They both squeeze and extend their toes or they separate the toes. They can do each toe, I'm sorry, each foot individually or do them together. Again, it's a very, very basic little drill, but I think what is the most important here is, and feel free to try it while you are watching. I think what's most important here again 
is that they are doing it frequently, a couple of times per day. The toe scrunch number one is kind of a basic exercise. Toe scrunch number two, after the initial shock, my folks love this drill. You get a box of Kleenex. If you're in a gym, just go to the restroom and steal some toilet paper or some paper towels. And what they're gonna do is using and improving the dexterity of their toes, they're going to pull a piece of Kleenex out of the box, put it on the floor. This is easier said than done. Drop the Kleenex and then grip it and move it from side to side. Move it front to back. When the, my older clients do this, it looks so simple, but they're amazed at how much dexterity it takes. And they're also amazed at how quickly their toes tie around. You can do this as a relay race. And what I mean by that is I'll put one box of Kleenex on the floor while they're in a seated in a circle. They pick out their Kleenex, then use their foot and push the box down to the next person. So that's the Kleenex or the tissue, Kleenex is a brand name, toe scrunch. For all these drills, try them on your own first. You might be amazed at the dexterity and the skill they actually take. So we started off with basic core conditioning and just a couple of basic drills to work on lower body function. We're gonna keep building on those. But a fundamental part of any balance program is the ability to shift our weight from side to side and stay upright. So this drill that you see is called the airplane. They're in their chairs. In a group, you can do this while maintaining social distance. And all they're doing is they're putting their arms out in the shape of a T. These folks are doing it while also squeezing a balloon between their legs, getting some good adductor work. And they're just doing a weight shift from side to side. Again, it looks very easy, and it is probably for you or for me, but for the less functional older adult with poor core control, this is a big deal. What they're working on is lateral stability. Quadratus lumborum comes right to mind for a muscle that's being worked here. You can't do this for an hour, but to do this for 10, 15, 20 seconds as another tool in your toolbox of balance drills, so it's a nice way to start off. Another thing you can do while seated, again, working on the core and keeping the core muscles strong against movement forces that are being generated from the shoulders and hips is called the lizard curl. They are comfortably seated, one leg and the opposite arm goes up, and that's all they're doing, moving one arm and the opposite leg. Remember that when we walk, we swing one arm in conjunction with the opposite leg. It's very rhythmic. The lizard crawl drill is a very, very rhythmic drill. It's a great drill. They are seated, they are comfortable, they are stable, but they are working their core. If they are in a chair with a back, try to have them do this without leaning against the back of their chair to bring in even more core control. And always, we're looking for good posture and no slouching or bending as they do this. You can't do it very long, guys. Their hip flexors begin to get out almost immediately. And I will generally follow up a drill like this or a similar drill with some stretches for the hip flexors afterwards. With a lizard crawl, a drill where we are now, while seated, coordinating or integrating core control with upper and lower body mobility. From here, we're gonna do another set of drill. If you're working with a group, all you need to do is have enough balls for the group. Um, I don't have, you know, I got 40 or 50 people. I don't have enough playground balls for everyone. So I usually put them in groups of four or five. They do a quick drill, pass the ball to the next person, and we work sequentially. But all we're doing here is tossing the ball up in the air. The ball goes up, we catch it, Say hello to your audience, the ball goes down. So it is up and down with the ball. It takes, again, a good bit of strength, core strength, mobility. And then 
by switching the ball from side to side, you're getting some thoracic rotation there as well. If you toss it a bit to the front, it forced them to do a lean forward. So again, what you have got is an exercise that is working on stability in different planes and where, and where you've got weight shifting from side to side and from front to back. We're doing it while they are seated, keep them safe. Eventually we will be doing this while standing as well. The seated ball toss. The ball bounce is quite similar. Same thing. Now we're still remaining safely seated for all of this. They're bouncing to the front. They're gonna start bouncing from side to side momentarily. And the idea is, again, controlling the core. The harder they bounce that ball, the higher it bounces. So it's core control and mobility and weight shifting. So the seated ball toss and the seated ball bounce are great ways to begin the integration of core control, upper body conditioning, and weight shifting. I strongly encourage you, unless your client is not very advanced, don't do this with a med ball because the focus of the entire drill begins to change. What I'm working with there is just a like $4.99 playground ball that I bought at Target. Now we're still being seated, but this drill is called the run in place drill. You can do this in any chair from any seated device, your beginning level, and some of your clients might need to start off slowly. They're just doing a toe tap or a heel tap in front while they're seated with good posture. So it's a beginning level. Our intermediate level goes to another level. Now they're doing knee lifts. Still kind of in slow motion. If they are less active, they will feel this. Their heart rate will elevate. Their breathing may elevate. If you're practicing social distancing and your clients are wearing masks, be very, very careful with this one. Because remember that mask restricts oxygen intake to begin with. We don't want them to be getting weak or dizzy or lightheaded. Now, for the more advanced client, as you're gonna see, we're taking this up to a whole new level. And if you're dealing this with these exercises in a group, as I do, some, if you were to take a look at my group shot, some of them are doing the beginning level, some intermediate, some advanced. So here we go. We're really kind of going full throttle. It's almost like we are doing a run in place. It's almost like we are really working on getting the heart rate up. So we're now moving the feet and the arms together. So a more advanced variation, and I know it looks foolish, but it's all for the greater good, is it not? So the more advanced running in place. Let me see where I'm going now. Okay, we did that one? Okay. So those were all of our, those were all of our seated drills. Now we're going to transition to more standing drills. So we're taking a look at now, we did the seated airplane earlier. Now we're going to move on to the standing airplane. It's the exact same thing, just a weight shift from side to side. If your client is more frail, if they are a fall risk, have a wall or a table nearby, but here comes your standing airplane. We did our seated toe lifts. Now we're moving to standing. As you can see, there's a chair right next to me. Just in case I were to lose my balance or feel a bit wobbly. So the standing toe lift is how we progress the seated toe lift. Again, the idea is to encourage our clients to do this multiple times per day, every day. The next variation is heel lifts and toe lifts. There's your alternating heel and toe, duplicating the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion that occurs when we walk. As you're doing this drill, guys, remember that a heel lift 
in the scheme of things is quite simple. People are more used to going on their tiptoes. So we've got the heel lift followed by the alternating heel and toe lift. Now, moving on to going to become a bit more advanced. This drill we call it swaying, and you'll see why. And you'll also see why momentarily it is so vital to have a chair nearby for support. They come up on their heels, but then they rock back and lift their toes. That action of rocking backwards makes it very, very advanced. Because as they rock back and lift their toes off the floor, they're doing a weight shift, where if they do not have good core control, gravity might just take over. And before you know it, they're on the ground on their backside. So be especially careful with this exercise of the toe lifts because of that backward weight shift. I very often like to do this drill with my clients having a wall behind them because very often what happens is when they lift those toes, they hip hinge and their backside comes in contact with that wall. So a bit, a bit more advanced. Support and stability is of paramount importance there. We talked about the one-legged stand earlier, but now we're going to take it to another level. For those of you guys who were with me yesterday, this is going to look a bit familiar. These are the only two slides that I'm duplicating because now that presumably we have our core strong and our lower body strong, it is time to move on. We do this with static stands, standing in place with one leg up and one leg down. To start off with, all we're doing is balancing with one foot off the ground. Right here, my foot is balancing on a plastic cup. Just because it's something to hang on to, minimal though it is. And from here, you can make it a bit more dynamic. They can tap the floor, tap the cup. Just an alternating one-legged stand with a chair right there for support if needed. But more of a static drill, meaning no movement, especially as we begin making it a bit more dynamic, what we've got now is adding the arms. The reason why I like doing this on the plastic cup is because if there's any kind of a dramatic weight shift, if I cannot maintain my balance in this example on my left leg, I'm gonna hear that cup begin to crunch. It's a very telltale sign, and I'm knowing now that my client is not as balanced as they could be. So we start off with the static and then move to the dynamic one-legged stand. Now keep in mind that because of the time constraints I've got this morning, I'm moving through these things very, very quickly. You know, we don't have the luxury of unlimited time. But in the real world, these drills, the progression from one to another can take days or even weeks. You know, when I've worked with clients who are more of a fall risk, who are more frail, it is several weeks before I ever get to the idea of doing a one-legged stand because my time up to that is base building and strengthening and so importantly, building their confidence as well. You know, if they're doing these drills and the whole time they're terrified, they're going to fall down and break something vital, they're going to lose them. So what we're doing initially is not only improving core strength and lower body strength, we are also improving confidence as well. So the progression was range of motion, seated, and then standing. And what we do now, if any of you guys got your microphones on, if you can have enough to mute them, please. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And what we're taking a look at now is we're transitioning. We did seated, we did standing. Now we are really gonna bring in those quads and hamstrings and glutes with transitional drills. We're back to our playground ball for the transitional sit to stand with toss. Here we go. We start off by just throwing the ball in the air, stand up, throw it up, sit down, toss, stand, toss and sit. 
I like to do this for about 30 seconds or so. They can't do it forever. But again, take a look at how we have integrated the workings of the upper body, the lower body, the core with weight shifting. You know, your clients, when I'm working with a group, I would never ever say do eight of these. I always say do 30 seconds. Why? Because I work with a mixed group. My more advanced people can knock out six, seven, eight of them in 30 seconds. My very frail people are lucky to get out one or two. This way, there's no pressure, there's no competition. Everyone works at their own speed, in their own way, and it works out quite nicely. So that is the first of our transitional drills, our sit to stand drill. We did the running in place earlier. Here's a transitional drill. It's based on the run and jump drill, although we can safely say that for our older clients, their jumping days are done. But here's how it looks, beginning level. They run, they stand. They run, and they stand. Again, doing this for 30 seconds or so, some might get six or eight done, others might get one or two. But that's the more intermediate level of the run and jump drill. It's about to get more advanced. I think it was important, especially in a group, is that everyone feels welcome. We feel very, very inclusive. My good buddy Paolo from Fit Factor here in Fort Lauderdale often covers my class for me. So I'm out of town, if I'm on vacation. And this was a day where he did the run and jump drill as a group activity. Now, Paolo is great at memorizing people's names. So he put folks into a circle. And what he did was they were all running in place. And he would call out a name. And as he called out a name, they would stand up. So they're all moving. You can see that some are standing way better than others, but they're continually in motion. Some are just bouncing right out of their chair. Some are not bouncing quite as well as others. These last two folks you just saw, Lillian and Ed, are both well into their 90s. So it's inclusive, it is inviting, it is non-threatening, it is non-competitive. If you're practicing social distancing, just keep those chairs six feet apart and you are good to go. So that is the group version of our run and jump drill. Also reinforcing the idea that every drill we are looking at this morning can be done in a group as well as individually. Here now is your more advanced variation. It's not for everyone. So they're running in place, they're standing and doing a knee lift. Run in place, stand and knee lift. Not for everybody, but while we're being inclusive, in my experience, if we treat everyone in our group as though they are a frail elder, a huge fall risk, one foot in the grave and one in the banana peel, we're going to lose our stronger clients. So I try and make sure there are enough modifications that my less able and my more able clients can all be involved and can all be included. But that is the advanced version of run and jump. And again, as I mentioned, no jumping, no jumping. You can do these in a relay race. What we have here are two lines of people. You can do this with social distancing, just keep the chairs further apart. A ball is making its way down the line from beginning to end. What happens is when they get the ball, they stand up, they hand the ball to the next person and sit back down. All there is to it. Again, the whole idea of these drills is integrating upper body, lower body, and core. And what I love about this drill is Jerry, the gentleman in the green shirt who is standing up there on the right. You can see that as he is handing the ball to Janice, he's got some thoracic and hip rotation in there as well. So we're working on the core, but we're working on very functionally any rotational drills as well. So that is your sit to stand relay. Moving to ever more dynamic and more advanced drills, you think of using the balloon in a group, and of course you can, but you can do the balloon one-on-one -on -one as well. My mistake in these photographs was it was a fairly windy day, which as you're going to see is going to come back to haunt me momentarily. So we're outside 
and all we're doing is trying to keep that balloon up in the air. Keeping it up with little taps will be a whole lot easier to control than with bigger taps. And you can see the palm tree in the back, how the breeze is picking up on me. I cut the video before you saw how that finally ended. It was not being a good role model, and I'll leave it at that. So there's your standing balloon tail. The balloon is inflated, and again, the harder you hit it, or the higher it goes in the air, the less control you have, and then you start having to move and take steps to reach for the balloon. Now, you're probably used to using balloons and having them fully inflated. Have you ever tried what I call a heavy balloon? A heavy balloon is a balloon that is only partially inflated. I inflate them roughly to the size of a myofascial release ball or a small med ball or, an, or a cantaloupe is probably a good way to put it as well. What happens is with a heavy balloon, it is under inflated. So when you hit it up in the air, it sinks, it sinks like a rock. A regularly inflated balloon is not quite lighter than air, but a good bit lovely, a good bit lighter than this sucker. So my, my dog loves this drill. I hope you don't mind the animals being in the frame. So here's the heavy balloon drill. You see how quickly it falls? And this is a much more advanced drill, where there's a lot more dexterity, a lot more ingenuity. Not ingenuity, well, ingenuity too. I meant to say agility is what I meant to say. So it just drops like a rock. This is not for your average client. It's for your more intermediate to advanced because it does require a whole lot more reaction time and response time. I've got to share with you as well that once the balloon hit the patio floor, it's, it's days were limited because once my dog got to it, that balloon was no more. The wave going to another level. What you've got now is a king size flat sheet. It's another core control, dexterity, standing drill. If you notice all these drills, we've kind of gotten rid of the sit component and now we're standing. My folks love this. I've gotten as many as 24 people around a king size sheet. On the left, what they're doing is they've got a balloon and they're just moving the sheet up and down to keep the balloon up and down in the air. All there is to it. If you are social distancing, I measure a king size flat sheet is about 106 feet, 106 feet, 106 inches square. Social distancing calls for us to be six feet apart. Six feet is 72 inches. You can put four people on a king size sheet have one person in each quarter, and you can still maintain your social distancing for the wave drill. And here's how it looks. For this one, I've got two balloons going, but they're moving up and down. They are hip hinging. They've got to react and respond. If you take a look at them, they're also laughing pretty uproariously for this drill. They enjoy it. It's tiring. What I love about this drill is my clients, even the ones who complain they've got arthritis, their shoulder hurts, and I'm not disputing that for a moment. What happens is during this drill, they forget their aches and pains for a while. I have never yet had somebody come up to me afterwards and say, oh my God, guy, I am really hurting after that drill. So what we're doing is it's fun. It is social, but there's also a good fitness goal here. Oh, we're, we're three balloons. I thought we were only at two. Core control with upper and lower body strength integration. The wave. Give it a shot. Guaranteed crowd pleaser. Okay. For your less able clients, we did lots of twister games yesterday in the plastic cup workout. Here's another variation. I did this over at the Jamaica Bay Senior Facility in Fort Myers, Florida. My good friend Nancy runs an incredible, incredible program there. Check out her YouTube virtual class that she has done since she has been on lockdown in Fort Myers. But on this particular day, I was invited in to do a Brains and Balance program for her folks. 
not knowing the level for folks, as it turns out, they were way stronger than they expected them to be. All we did was on the folding tables they had in their community room, we did stripes of masking tape, blue, yellow, and green. Had six or eight people per table. And then all we did was put them in groups around each table and called out a color. Right hand blue, left hand green, right hand yellow, both hands green. I actually turned off the volume for this one because the volume was so deafening, you could not hear my voice over now. You can do this singly, you can do it in large groups, small groups. This was a huge group. I believe that Nancy had almost 100 there that morning, that morning for the Brains and Balance program. What they're doing is they are hip hinging and doing a forward weight shift while we're also practicing on reaction time and response time. You can see the inflated inner tubes on the floor. Hold that thought, because those are going to figure in, importantly, in another drill. So that is masking tape twister. For the client that might not be able to get down to the floor, you can also put mask tape on the floor and do you know right foot green tape, left foot blue tape, and so forth. It's all a matter of ingenuity and knowing what you've got to work with. But that is the masking tape tabletop twister. Remember the inner tubes? Here we go. Now in Florida, I buy these inner tubes. I can usually get them six for five dollars at the party store or the dollar store. But here's what we do. Still, they've got that table there for support. And all they're doing is they're using that inner tube like a frisbee. They've got a step, they've got a weight shift, they've got to react, they've got to respond. You can see how they are all laughing hysterically. Remember what I said earlier that I regard my balance programs as a party. For many of my folks, this really is part of their social life, the hour a week that we spend together. So inner tube frisbee, some of the more advanced ones are catching it on their head. They're catching it on a straight arm. So it's a great variation. And you know what? The play aspect of this drill is so significant. Good. Can you hear me? You're working. Yes, sir. Dan, go ahead, sir. Somebody's asking, what was the what was the name of the lady you mentioned? Was it Nancy? Yeah, Nancy Ramke okay. from Jamaica Bay in Fort Myers. Got it. Great. Thanks. You're very welcome. So that is the Frisbee drill. This is one of my staples. I do this often. Okay. Now we're going to move as we begin to wrap this up to unstable balance. Now, I know that when people think of unstable balance, they think of like people standing on top of bolster balls or balance discs or these very elaborate balance, you know, a wobble board. Oh, for God's sakes. You know, if my clients could stand on one leg on a wobble board or a bosu, they would not need my balance class. I think that's what's important is destabilize them in a way that is a bit safer and a bit less dangerous, so there's less fall risk. There are so many things you can use in lieu of a wobble board or a bosa ball. A rolled up bath towel, like you see here, is ideal. A sofa cushion or a bed pillow. You know those eggshell, um, those foam eggshell pads they put on a mattress? Those are great for balance. A rolled up yoga mat. Make sure there's always something stable to hang on to. But where I'm going with this is yes, we do want to make them unstable, but functionally unstable. What are the odds that our client will ever be as unstable as they are on a bosa ball or a wobble board? At what point does our balance training turn into a circus trick? So, and those of you guys that know me, now I'm the most risk averse man you can imagine. I do not take risks, period. There's ways that we can destabilize them, work on our goals, work on function without risking a trip to the ER. Which is why for our beginning balance stamp, all I've got is a rolled up table there. I'm hanging out in the chair if I need to, and trying to stand on. If you take a look, guys, the ankle 
my ankle is wobbling. It's supposed to do that. That wobble means it is decelerating that downward pull of gravity. If you've got poor ankle mobility, if that ankle can't wobble front and back and side to side, what's going to happen is those movement forces go right up the movement chain and their fall risk goes up. This is why we began our journey today with those um, mobility drills, those ankle range of motion drills. So there's your beginning to stand. What happens, as you can see, is that the body weight begins to compress that roll up towel. And that's fine. You can always do a re roll or fluff it up if you need to. Your intermediate one leg stand looks like this, just adding some dynamic movement there. The chair is there if they need to. If they don't need to hang on, that's fine. Adding both hip and knee range of motion to make it more intermediate. The advanced stand, we're going to let go of the chair now and add some significant upper body movement. Here we go. We're doing the airplane. We're doing a variation of the jumping jack. The ankle is wobbling because it's supposed to, because we're alive. So the one-legged advanced stand, we're just adding the motion of the upper body. By this point, hopefully our core is strong. Hopefully our lower leg is strong that we can do this while remaining vertical. Now these stability drills we've just done, because I know the folks say is working in a group, this can be done in a group very easily. You can maintain your social distancing if that's a concern. You know, every gym, every state right now is different. Right now, social distancing in Florida is a concern. Um, this one, you've got you know, different balance stations. The group stands around in a circle, and you know, one person has got a rolled up towel, one person has got a yoga mat. Maybe we are going to use a balance pad pad or a foam exercise mat. One person's got a solo cut there. And what they do is for 10 seconds or so, maybe a bit more if they're advanced, they put one foot on the unstable surface and they try and maintain their balance. Remember, they're not balancing on the, on the solo cup. Their foot's on the floor. They're not standing on the solo cup. Their question comes up more than you can imagine. After about 10 seconds, they come down and they rotate clockwise or kind of clockwise to the next station. It is based on the premise that every implement we are using requires the muscles to react in a slightly different way. So we're pulling in different muscles and different muscle recruitment patterns every time we change our level of stability. Always do this with support available just in case. If you're dealing with a large group, you know, you might have, you know, four, five, six stations set up around the room where people are working out simultaneously. So that, my friends, is what we call the circle of stability. Okay, and now as we get to wrap this up, is we're gonna move now to ambulation drills. To me, ambulation drills are an important part of the overall balance and fall prevention process. If our clients want to remain independent and functional, if they want to remain at home, they have got to be functional around the house. They've got to walk from point A to point B. They've got to get up and down from their chair or the bed. You know, many of my clients are still driving. They've got to get groceries into the house and garbage out of the house. They've got to do laundry. They've got to tidy up. They've got to work the vacuum. Where I'm going with this, is function and independence are not compatible with training in a chair. So what we're doing now is we're doing a variety of different ambulation drills. These four ladies call themselves the Red Brigade based on their hair color. Um, and they are very active. The youngest is 62. The oldest is 91. So we have a whole cross section here of seniors and fitness. Cross the creek. It's a walking drill. I've got two pieces of yellow masking tape, 24 inches apart. All they are doing is as they are walking, 
they are trying to cross the creek without getting their foot wet. That's all there is to it. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice drill. So across the creek. If you're not sure of how wide a step your client can manage, here's what we call the graduated cross the creek drill. What you have here now is two pieces of tape in a V shape. I usually make this course around eight feet long. At the wide section, the tape is 24 inches apart. At the narrow section, about six inches. The object now is as they are walking to cross the creek at the widest possible point they can without getting their feet wet. Very often, folks are cautious. I find that they often will go down to a more narrow part, more narrow than they are capable of doing, but that's cool because they are building their confidence. What I am looking for mainly, guys, on this drill is can they cross the creek without stopping or do they pause and hesitate? I usually begin them 8, 10, 12 feet away so they can generate some speed as they approach the creek, or as we say in the south, the creek, they can generate some speed. If they slow down or hesitate, that's not a good sign because that, hes that hesitancy may translate as an increased fall risk in the real world. It could also mean that they're just being hyper cautious. So what we want to take a look at is where they cross and do they hesitate or stop before crossing the creek. The other variation is to do a lunge. They're standing on one side of the creek, they lunge over, their feet are not getting wet, and then they push back to the starting position requires a huge amount of muscular control and muscular function. So these are variations of our cross the creek drill. Your only investment is some masking tape. The trash, the trash dash guaranteed crowd pleaser. Okay, you divide your group up into teams, equal teams, four teams. You have at least three or four ping pong balls or tennis balls per person and four buckets. You put the buckets in each corner of the room or the play area with an equal number of balls per bucket. The trash dash, we are pretending that the bucket is a garbage can and the ping pong balls are the trash. What the folks are gonna try and do is empty their trash. I usually run this drill for 60 to 90 seconds. What you do is they are all clustered by their bucket, by their garbage can. When you give the signal to go, they choose one bucket, not one bucket, one ping pong ball at a time, and they deposit the ping pong ball in the bucket of another team. So they're getting rid of their trash by giving it to someone else. Of course, while they are getting rid of their trash, somebody is putting ping pong balls in their bucket as well. At the end of 60, 90 seconds, the goal is to have as few buckets, I did it again, as few balls in the bucket as possible. The buckets can be on the floor. If you don't want them to bend, put the bucket on a chair or on a table. And here's what it looks like. It is sheer chaos. Here they go. Some move faster than others, but they are all moving. If you take a look at their faces, they're smiling, they're laughing. They're shouting as they do this. The din was absolutely unimaginable. When I say they cheat, you know what they do? They take a handful of balls and throw them in someone else's bucket. But that is the trash dash. The goal again is to get rid of all the trash in their bucket and give it to somebody else. Guaranteed crowd pleaser. I do it for 60 or 90 seconds. Um, it's very fatiguing. Some of these folks are moving faster than they are used to in the real world. So assess. Five, if they are weak or dizzy or lightheaded, they can, they can sit down, okay? Somebody was asking me yesterday about how I do drills for older adults who might be heavy or overweight or obese. As you can see, I've got some plus size folks in this class. 
but they are just integrated right with everybody else. So that, my friends, is the trash dash. And finally, our ladder drills. Um, my, next, my next program for seniors for our webinar series is going to be acceleration, deceleration, and ladder drills. But that's how I do it. I do not use a commercial ladder because commercial ladders represent a huge tripping hazard and they're expensive as well. I make my ladders with painter's tape because I have a large class, the right side photograph. I have got um, multiple ladders put together. The left-hand photographs, I was for a less able group where I've got either a wall or a table nearby for everyone to hang on to. I usually make these squares about 18 inches square. Um, and what do they do? They walk forward, one foot per square or two feet. They walk tiptoe. They do long strides walking every other square. They can do a grapevine with caution. They can do a lateral walk, either one foot or more commonly two feet per square. If they are very advanced and you are very secure in their abilities, they can do a retro walk and walk backwards, although that's not usually my style. So ladder drills are the last part of our ambulation drills. So what we have done is we have covered a whole gamut of different drills today, starting from assessment to mobility, stability, seated, standing, standing unstable, transitional drills, and movement drills. So what you've got there, based on your client, your equipment, your space, their ability level, is you've really got enough there to either progress a client from beginning to more advanced, or to challenge them based on what their fitness level is or what their um, skill level is. So I'm, I'm actually, my timing was better than I expected it to be. If we've got a couple more minutes, um, we've got time again for questions. Guys, thank you for coming. If you want today's outline, it is already posted on the Exercise Center Facebook page. The link is there. You do not have to be a Facebook <laughs> member or have an account to do this. I'm going to put my my camera back on. Yeah, and I, I would love, if we can, I'd love to get a group picture. Um, don't unmute yourself, please, because if 60 people unmute, we'll have uh, chaos. But uh, if you've got a question, type it in. But I'd love to see your faces. So if everybody wants to hop on camera, we can get a big group picture. We had 70 people on live at one point, Guy. Um, awesome. We're down to we're down to 65 at the moment because I think people are hungry. Uh, hungry. They're they're looking for their lunch or potty break like I am. Um, but uh, thanks again for your time. Um, Thank somebody, you. Somebody somebody absolutely loved your your trash and dash, and I think that's a good too. So, um, and I I like the the tape the tape down ladder or even you know building that into your your floor. I've seen some places where they they literally have it like drawn on the onto their floor so it's a lot safer than putting something out that somebody's got to trip on or catch with their feet or whatever so uh, we got a good sized group here a um, couple different questions that came in uh, several people want to know who this Nancy uh, is it Remke how do you spell her last name um, her name is, is geez I hope I'm not crossing a line here but her name is Ranke R-A-N-K-E okay and Ranke. some people were asking about that you showed pictures of the different facility is that um, Parks and Rec, is it a senior center? Where are you going where you have these huge rooms of tables? And um, the one that I was at in Fort Myers, which we had over 100 people, that is a very, very large residential community, and that is their multi-purpose room. They can do banquets for hundreds, they do movie night there. The facility that I show most frequently is the one that I use. It's the community center for the city of Wood Manor in their parks and recreation headquarters and we can fit easily about 300 people in that room if we put our minds to it so wow, these yeah, are large look, rooms look look like a huge 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 place yeah. so yeah that's cool yeah. um all right uh lee says that was an awesome seminar thank you so much first time attending the fai summit several people saying it's the first time they've ever seen you speak and enjoying it yeah, that's uh, good 
Joanne uh, says, I'm a rock steady boxing coach as well as an FAS and certified personal trainer. All of these would be great. Those folks love everything we did. Thank you for the new ideas. Unfortunately, she has to wait until senior centers open up again. Um, I'm not sure if it's Eves, Y-V-E-S, not sure how to pronounce that name, but um, as asking about doing some of these things barefoot, I mean, I noticed some of your videos, you're doing things barefoot. So what's your thoughts on barefoot? Um, it depends on my environment. If I'm in a gym environment in Florida, we must wear shoes. I mean, that's, that's the state law, health department. Um, when I'm teaching at the, at the Parks and Recreation Department, if my folks come in in flip-flops, which is a very common thing in Florida year-round, um, I won't let them do balance drills in flip-flops because the tri of the trip risk. Um, so they do it either barefoot or they watch. Outside, I'm in the grass or the sand. Again, it's Florida. I like being barefoot. There is research and documentation. I believe it was in the book um, Thaw Proof by Dr. Deborah Rose, where mm -hmm. she mentions the benefit of barefoot training as does um, Sue Scott in Able Body, Bodies Balance Training. You know, we've just got such better proprioception, the feet and the toes move much more naturally and organically when barefoot. Um, I think there's a place in our balance program for both barefoot and shoe training personally. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Uh, as, as with as with uh, everything, I think there's a place for, uh, for both, right? There's an appropriate time for yeah, some things and appropriate time for other things. And, Depends on the environment. And, so you know, down here in South Florida, the reality of our climate is we don't wear shoes a lot. Many of my right. folks, if they're in the house, they're barefoot. So sure. you know, it's it's functional to balance training barefoot. I'm barefoot right now. So As am I. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of a, a summit online. I um, haven't worn hard shoes or long pants since early March. I don't leave the house. <laughs> All right, let's do uh, two more questions. Um, I did get a group photo, so that's good. Um, for those on the recording, remember it's super simple to uh, get the handout. You go to Guy's Facebook page and he's provided it there for you. Um, any other questions before we let Guy go and we all head out to, uh, to lunch? Uh, one more reminder, um, lots of comments here, Guy. I'll send you the chat file. Um, one more reminder, there is one lunch networking session live Q&A with Cody Seip and Paul Holbrook talking about power. So if you want some live Q&A, um, they will be doing that uh, starting right now. So uh, lots of kudos, lots of thanks. Um, here's a question coming in. Um, how much time do you devote to balance training during a full session? Um, in my one hour brains and balance session, I allow 20 minutes for train the brain drills and 40 for balance drills. And realistically, out of that 40 minutes, we're probably moving for maybe 20 or 25. But then yeah. we get them organized, get them set. You know, uh, very often, um, older adults move a bit slower. So it's, it's a 20, it's a 20, 40 split. Sure, sure, sure. All right, well, Guy, thanks so much for your support Thank of you the Functional Aging Summit online this year. Again, check out Guy's Virtual Expo. He's got some uh, more information on his webinars and different programs. Uh, so hit the Virtual Expo button, hit his Facebook page for the handout. If you're watching the recording, uh, just go to his Facebook page since the Virtual Expo may be gone. So thanks again, Guy. Thank you, and guys, thank you for spending your morning with me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks yep. for having me, Dan. Yep, see you, everyone. See ya.